Hey guys, how's it going? Paul Harris here. Welcome back to another of my videos. Now, today I'm going to talk about communication. Why am I going to talk about this? Well, Denise sent me an email asking me to consider making a video about communication. So that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my sort of tips of what I've experienced working as a financial accountant, becoming ACA qualified to working where I'm at now, uh, obviously working on client facing roles, working with senior management, you know, partners, CFOs, the kind of things that would be useful if you just started as a trainee ACA uh, student. So hopefully you find it useful. Let's get into it. First thing I'm going to talk about is communicating with people who are on the same banding as you versus talking to people who are senior managers, directors and partners. So this is something I probably had harsh lessons learning because I'm quite a chatty person. I like to accept that everybody is like a mate. And unfortunately, when you're in the workplace, that's probably not the best strategy to go on. Uh, you know, work is actually quite a serious thing. Uh, people take things very seriously. So my first piece of advice is when you're talking to a director and a partner, even if they're matey with you, don't confuse them for being friends. Talk to them in a very professional manner because uh, you don't want to act like a prat, basically, um, by trying to crack jokes or say something that's informal. Because really what their opinion of you is, is all that matters really when it comes down to your job. Obviously you want to do your job correctly, but you want to com communicate with them in a proper manner. Now the thing with communication is, it's not something if you communicate well, it's not something that's going to get praised very much, but if you communicate poorly, it can reflect very badly on you. So always think about how you're communicating. Now, Next point is when you're communicating with partners, therefore, or directors or senior people in your company, and say you have a meeting, this is another harsh lesson I learned, is don't feel like you need to fill the gaps. Particularly when you just started working, you're gonna know the least um, about the scenario. So you might feel this urge to try and communicate, you know, if you've just had an interview and you had to do some sort of group study, then the, you're very keen to say things all the time. And that's what's perceived as being a good quality is saying a lot. But when you're actually working, really want to limit the amount you say in meetings where there's very senior people and definitely not when you're man not managing a job. You know, what you want to communicate with is when people ask you a direct question and you want to you know, be able to give a response and give a formal response. And don't feel like you need to have all the answers. Just give a response that you think suitable. And if you don't know the answer, just say, can I get back to you on that? Um, you know, can I send you an email? I don't have the answers in front of me. As opposed to trying to just make stuff up, which is often what I fell into the trap of doing, is trying to create an answer. Is if you're in an exam and you know, when a question comes up and you don't know the answer, you just have to try and make stuff up. When you're in a job, you don't have to make things up. If you don't know the answer, just don't say it. It's all about limiting the amount that the very senior people in the company, um, you know, think that you're just making stuff up. It doesn't, it doesn't reflect well. Also, when you're talking to very senior people, when you give an answer and you have to be definite, because they'll probably ask you, are you sure? To which you then have to say yes, <laughs> because why would you give an answer that you weren't sure about? Um, it doesn't reflect well when you then have to come back and go, oh, that thing I was sure about isn't actually true. So limit what you say, particularly when you're in a meeting scenario, which might sound counterintuitive, as I say, because you want to try and, you know, build a reputation as being a communica uh, communicative person. Um, okay, so that's that point. That's my view of talking to people senior. Um, obviously, the lower down you get in terms of job roles and people who are just working with you, maybe you're on a graduate scheme, obviously, you can be matey with them and you want to communicate with them and talk about any issues you're having because they're the people who are going to be the best people to be able to respond and uh, understand exactly the sort of situation you're in. So the second point is when you started a company, Everyone knows you know very little, uh, unless you sort of are very experienced and move to a different company and start a new job. Um, obviously, then it's assumed that you have some sort of prior knowledge, even if it's not uh, specific to the sort of company and the sort of product that the company makes. 
But say you're just starting out in your career, people are going to know you don't know much, particularly about accounting and stuff. But what people like is for people to really get involved. That's where the communication comes in. You know, you want to be somebody who, and when I talk about communication, it's not just about what you say, it's about how you are perceived, how your body language is. When you're on a job for the first time, you want to be asking for more work. You want to be getting your head stuck in and saying if you don't have work that you need to do. You don't just want to be passing the time and just assuming people are going to give you stuff, which they probably will in vast quantities. But there's going to be times where you feel like you could you have more workload that you could be doing and helping out and communicating like that is definitely going to give you an advantage when you're first starting out in a role next page and on this point another thing that you need to do when you start out is when people ask you to do stuff even if you know it's not a very nice job to do, you know, it's a very admin task, it's very time consuming, it's not something you enjoy doing. You want to give the impression that you really want to do it. <laughs> now, I've always had criticism in the start, I had a lot of criticism because I wore my heart on my sleeve, people could tell I wasn't happy if I wasn't happy about something, and it's a very hard thing to try and hide, uh, particularly if you're a very open person like I am. If I'm disappointed about something, I look disappointed about it, unfortunately. You know, even, this is just a off on a tangent, I even got told a couple of times to try and dial down my personality. <laughs> um, yeah, not great experiences. But when you're in a role and someone asks you to do something, just seem very keen about it. Smile, get stuck in, be positive, just think... Just think, ah, oh, this is ain't great, but as long as you're just perceived as wanting to do work, doing work, that's all you can really ask for from someone who's a quite a junior member of the staff when you get started. Because particularly if you're working with someone who's only newly manager, they not, might not feel inclined to want to give you a load of work, but they're going to have a huge quantity of stuff to do. So just by being somebody who wants to get involved is a very good quality trait for someone who's just starting out. The next point is how do you communicate? What's the most effective way to communicate? And what I mean by this is when you start out, I think there's an order to which you should request things or to uh, discuss things with people and it goes in person over the phone via email that's the order that I think is the most effective and that's the order that you'll get the most done the added benefit of using that order is that you just build relationships a lot quicker if you see people in person you're having face-to-face -face contact with them if you're over the phone you ha can communicate over the phone you can ask them how they're doing via an email is a very tempting thing to do but it kicks the bucket along the line when it comes to actually getting work done in a quick manner. Because when you send an email out, what you're effectively doing is, I can't be bothered to find out what the answer is straight away. I'm just going to let it simmer and then hopefully they get back to me in a day or two. You know, that might happen. They might get back to you straight away if it's someone who knows you already and you've built a relationship up. But if you're someone that you don't have a relationship with somebody, they might be less inclined to just respond to your email. You might be someone new. So having a phone call, going to arrange, even if you have to arrange a meeting just to see them in person, then um, that that is a probably a more preferable way to communicate with somebody. You know what's funny about sending emails, just on another tangent, is when you start, <laughs> you all, I started your know, client-facing role, you start by going, you know, Dear John, uh, dear John, and then you say underneath, I hope you had a good weekend. Hope you're well. Um, I hope you wouldn't mind providing me with this document um, if you have a moment. You know, you, you write it so formally. There's so much faff in between the request that you're actually writing. You have like three <laughs> starter sentences. Now, I don't know if everybody does that, but I always felt like I was the start of how I uh, wrote everything. And then that was what what is like in a client facing role. When you talk to colleagues, I then was taken aback by when someone just responded as like a one liner. And particularly, what seems to happen is when you go to a non client facing role, like you work in a company, um, and you're just working in a finance department, everyone then just sends like very very short messages, just very blunt requests. Um, you know, not even with please and thank yous. That really drives me mad. 
just sort of statements. And it's like, what well, I have to work out what you want from this statement. So I always think it's good to be clear about what, uh, what you want in emails. But I don't think all the, maybe when you're in a client facing, you're just starting, but all this dear somebody, hope you had a good uh, evening, um, you know, three other lines about, you know, kind regards, yours sincerely, all that stuff. And then when you get more senior, people just literally just write like one word in an email because I guess their time is just worth more. So they're just very brief. But it's funny how you transition from this starting point where you write ridiculously long emails to like the end point where you just like one sentence, you know, do you have that document yet, please? Okay. Um, so the next point I want to make, and I'm probably going to wrap up soon. I don't know how long this video is, but well, you know, when someone talks things about communicating, the first thing you might think about is like having to present something and presenting, I think in, I think in the UK, or at least it was presenting and public speaking was like the number one fear of UK people. So like in other countries, it's spiders. And I think in the UK, it was quite high. People don't like public speaking. It's kind of something that they're nervous of. But I think it's a very valuable skill because presenting something really makes sure that you actually understand the topic that you're learning about. Uh, so it really tests you to some degree. My advice for people who aren't very keen on presenting is actually to look for opportunities to present in any sort of manner. You know, you can practice the craft of presenting and becoming more confident by maybe presenting in smaller numbers and building up to larger audiences. And I think the sheer... Uh, guts it takes when someone says who wants to present this to stand up and go I want to is like the first step of building yourself up to being you know faking it till you make it in terms of the confidence it needs to present and I have a bit of a bugbear when it comes to uh, presentations uh, I'm not working for a client facing role anymore but when I uh, when I go to a lot of meetings now where someone's presenting like a PowerPoint presentation, there's a couple of bugbears I have. The first one, well, there's only really one, and that is assume that everybody in the meeting doesn't really have any idea what you're talking about. Um, because you've worked on that presentation, you know every single bit of information that's on it, hopefully, and you're really keen to get across certain points. But when you're presenting, establishing the premise is a very important point and establishing what you're actually talking about. It doesn't have to be long. I think some people can sometimes spend 10 minutes of the present 20 minute presentation establishing what's the, you know, the premise is. But you need to people to understand what you're actually talking about. When you open up a slide um, and it has numbers, it has a graph, it has something else, People aren't going to frant, you know. People aren't doing an exam. People aren't going to frantically look at every graph and under understand instantly what it is. So just spend a bit of time explaining on each slide what it is that people are looking at before then going into the detail about what you're communicating about. And at the start of the presentation, actually talk about the key points of, you know, just summarize in a way what the presentation is about. You know, the same thing applies. Uh, you know, Chris Rock says this is the same thing applies for comedians. Sometimes someone can have a very good joke, but people don't find it funny because they haven't established the premise well enough. If people can't follow the storyline if you don't establish what the point of the presentation is. That's it. Hope you found that interesting. That is my thoughts on communication. That's just some points that I thought of that... Uh, probably frequently come up and might help you if you've just started out. Hopefully you found that interesting. If you did, please do subscribe to my channel. Let me know what kind of topics you want me to talk about. Apologies for not making enough videos. I have a child who's one years old and it takes a lot of energy up. So struggle to find the time to make videos. But there we are. I'm going to try and make more videos. I say that every single time. Who knows when the next video will be. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye bye, guys.